Carnegie Hall in New York City, the home of the world's greatest musical events. Today's event is one in a series of New York Philharmonic Young People's Concerts under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein. And here is Mr. Bernstein. Did you guess what that was? What is it? Happy birthday, all right. Only it's the great Igor Stravinsky's individual way of saying happy birthday in an arrangement he made of it a few years ago to celebrate the 80th birthday of his great friend Pierre Monteux, the famous conductor. And so now that Mr. Stravinsky's own 80th birthday is coming up in June, what better way is there for us to say happy birthday to him than by playing it back to him in his own language? But when we say happy birthday to Igor Stravinsky, as we're doing on this program, we're not only giving him our congratulations and our wishes for many more healthy, productive years, we are also play, paying tribute with all our respect and admiration and devotion to the greatest composer in the world today. Now that's a big statement, but I don't think anyone will argue about it. Whatever your tastes are, romantic or classical or very up-to-date, there are works by Stravinsky that you will love. And all of these works are in a personal style and a language all his own. You can never mistake that Stravinsky sound, just like the version of Happy Birthday we just heard. It's an amazing thing, this original personality he has, especially when you think of how many times he's changed his style of composing over the last 50 or 60 years, just as he's changed his country from Russia, where he was born, to France, to America, where he lives now, in California. He started out, back in Russia, writing music for big orchestra, brilliant, luscious, colorful music, like the ballet The Firebird, the ballet Petrushka, and the world-shaking ballet The Rite of Spring. Now that was a revolutionary piece. It changed the history of music with its strange new rhythms and barbaric grunting and howling and its massive dissonant chords like these. Everybody was shocked by that back in 1913. Shocked either into wild excitement or into fury. But everyone was impressed by this new thunderous genius. And just when they thought they had his number, a thunderer, he switched on them with the ease of a bullfighter reversing his cape. Whoosh! And Stravinsky had a new style. Small orchestras, sharp, pointy little music precise, tricky rhythms, plus a whole new idea called neoclassicism, which means a new look at old 
classic styles. That is, he was suddenly writing music that reminded one faintly of old Handel, or of Mozart, or of Bach, as in these few bars from his concerto for small orchestra called Dumbarton Oaks. change, isn't it, from the howling of the right of spring. But then came the biggest switch of all, only in these last ten years. You see, since the beginning of our century, there's been a new kind of music developing in the world, sometimes called atonal music, sometimes twelve-tone music or serial music. And now Stravinsky had always been writing the exact opposite of this kind of music. But lo and behold, in the last ten years, he has fooled the bull again with a swish of the cake and begun to write his own kind of serial music or atonal music, whatever you want to call it. Just listen to these few bars from his latest ballet called Aegon. <laughs> That's really a switch. In fact, Stravinsky has become now the world leader of this kind of music. And so it is this king, Igor, that we salute today, the ever-changing, ever-new, ever-young King Igor, who at the age of 80, imagine 80, is still handing out the biggest surprises in the whole world of music. Now, just to help you understand what we mean by surprises, let's jump for a minute from music to painting and think of the greatest painter in the world today, who is Picasso, of course, who is also in his 80s and who also holds some kind of world record for changing from one style to another. Now, just look at these three pictures. Here's a drawing of a woman by Picasso, normal enough. That's made in 1905. Now, here's one painted in 1911, also of a woman, if you can believe it. Uh, can you believe that's the same man who painted the first picture? And now here is a woman, believe it or not, also by Picasso, painted in 1945. They might be three completely different painters. How about that for fooling the bull? Well, this is exactly what Stravinsky has done, only in music, through musical notes. I wish we had time today to give you a sample of all his different styles and moods, but then you wouldn't get to hear any one of his works whole. So to honor him today on his birthday, we have decided to play for you one masterpiece of his and play all of it, the famous ballet Petrushka. Now, we're going to play Petrushka not only because it's exciting music, but especially because it is so close to young people and to children. Stravinsky himself has said that his music is loved and understood best by children. I don't know if this is strictly true, but it's certainly true of his Petrushka, which takes us into the world of dolls and puppets with all the imagination and fantasy that go with them. But what makes Petrushka even more special is that the story of the ballet tells of two worlds at once, the real world of people like us and the unreal world of puppets who come to life so that the doll world and the human world almost become one and the same. Now, the story of Petrushka is based on an old Russian legend, but I'm not going to tell you the whole story at once because I don't want to give away the surprise ending until it comes. Instead, I will tell you about each one of its four scenes as we go along. First scene, imagine yourselves at a fair in a great crowded square of St. Petersburg, Russia, over a hundred years ago, long before that city got its modern name of Leningrad. It's carnival time, a bright cold day, and everyone in town has turned out for a good time, old and young, rich and poor, drunk and sober, they're all crowding around the booths and into the carousel and onto the swings. And the music is all festivity and bustle. <laughs>
Now, in one part of the square, a bunch of the boys are whooping it up with a Russian folk song. And over in another part of the square, an organ grinder is playing a waltz while a young girl dances to it. While across the way, another pretty girl is waltzing to a music box. And then we hear the two waltzes together. And suddenly, two drums announce that a puppet show is going to begin. And the crowd surges around the puppet theater in the middle of the square. Now, this theater is run by a mysterious old oriental-type magician whom Stravinsky describes like this. Uh, this, uh, this old magician opens the curtain of his little theater, revealing three life-sized puppets. First, a beautiful ballerina in her ballet dress and a fierce-looking African prince, or moor, as he's called, all decked out in silks and velvets with jewels in his turban. And last of all, little Petrushka, which, as you can guess, is a Russian nickname for Peter. Petrushka, a sweet, pathetic, awkward boy, rather like Pinocchio. And while the orchestra plays spooky music, the old magician makes some hocus-pocus at the three puppets and plays to them on his magic flute. And then suddenly, one, two, three, they magically come to life. And to the amazement of the crowd, they begin to dance under their own steam. <laughs> And with that famous dance, the first scene ends. But for the story of Petrushka himself, it's only the beginning, as you will see. Now here is the entire first scene of Petrushka.
We left Petrushka dancing along with the ballerina and the moor before an astonished crowd in the square of St. Petersburg. But now, with the second scene, we leave the square and the crowd and all of what we call real life and move into the world of the puppets themselves, that is, into their real world, backstage in the puppet theater where each of them has his own little room to live in. Now, don't forget that the moment these three dolls received life from the magician's flute, they also acquired all the human, human feelings and passions that go with life. And Petrushka has the most sensitive feelings of the three. He's lonely, funny looking, awkward, and madly in love with the beautiful ballerina. But of course, she won't have him. She prefers his rival, the fierce, foolish Moor, who is richer and bigger and fancier. And Petrushka, naturally, is desperate. Uh, as we move toward his room in the little theater, to the accompaniment of those drums, we hear little doll-like screams. They're Petrushka's screams, of course, as he flings himself about his room, sobbing. Now that's what this whole scene is about, the agony of Petrushka. In it, you'll hear every imaginable kind of sobbing and weeping, shrieking, wailing, beating the walls. It's heartbreaking music. Just listen to Petrushka's theme on the two clarinets with the bassoon against them, sobbing its heart out. Isn't that a weird and wonderful sound? And you know what makes it so special? Our old friend, bitonality. Remember that hard word from our earlier programs this season? Bitonality, music played in two different keys at once. You see, one clarinet is playing in one key, C major. And the second clarinet is in another key, F sharp major. And together, they make that special sound that has become the most famous example of bitonality in all music. In fact, musicians always refer to this combination of C major and F sharp as the Petrushka sound. Isn't that wonderful? And when Petrushka really goes mad with suffering, his theme sounds like this. Well, I guess that's about all you have to know about this short but high-powered second scene of Petrushka, which is a picture of Petrushka alone in his room.
drums tell us that we are moving into scene three, which is now in the Moor's room. Now the ballerina, at one point, pops in to visit him, playing on a toy trumpet, and the Moor dances a sentimental little waltz with her, a sort of doll's love scene. And in the middle of it, we suddenly hear Petrushka's theme coming closer and closer until finally he breaks into the room in a fit of jealousy. There's a chase around the room, the ballerina faints, and at the climax, the boar grabs poor little Petrushka and boots him out with a painful series of whacks, which I'm sure you'll all recognize. Here we are in scene three in the Moor's room.
Kor Petrushka. He doesn't stand a chance in this cruel, real world he's been brought into. And at this point, we too are brought back to our real world. Because in the fourth and last scene, we're taken back to the great square in St. Petersburg, where the carnival fun is now at its height. By now, it's late in the day, the lights are beginning to come on, and the air is thick with sounds and smells and human bodies everywhere. This marvelous final scene is like a huge painting of Russian life, full of lusty Russian folk tunes and foot-tapping rhythms. And into the midst of all this wild hilarity runs poor, half-crazy Petrushka, fleeing for his life from the wicked moor. Uh, somehow they've both broken out of their world backstage and are running loose in the square. You see how the two worlds have gotten mixed up together into one. So here comes Petrushka with the moor in hot pursuit. The crowd stops dead in its tracks seeing this incredible sight. And it's only a moment before the moor catches up with Petrushka and, I'm sorry to say, kills him with one blow of his saber. Petrushka falls and dies in the snow with everyone looking on in horror. And at this very second, in hobbles the old magician who started the whole thing by bringing his puppets, his puppets to life in the first place. But the old man simply picks up Petrushka's lifeless body and shows it to the crowd. Look, he says, it's only a doll, rags, sawdust, stuffing, and a wooden head. And indeed, it is only a doll. So everyone quietly goes home. It's now dark. It begins to snow. And finally, the stage is empty, except for the weird old magician dragging his broken doll away. But at that moment of near silence, two trumpets suddenly pierce the air like flashes of lightning, playing Petrushka's theme. Ta -da -da, ta -da -da, ta -da -da and there, on the roof of the little theater, we see Petrushka's ghost laughing away at the old guy, thumbing his nose at him. The magician is terrified, drops the doll, and runs away. Silence, absolute emptiness. There's just a tiny, faint echo of accordion-like music hangs in the air. And then a few vague plucked notes in the strings, and the ballet's over leaving us hanging in suspense between one world and the other. Did all this really happen? Was that Petrushka's ghost up there, or was it the real Petrushka? Or is the real Petrushka, after all, only that broken hunk of rags and stuffing, which was made real to us for a few minutes by the magic of Stravinsky's great art?
From Carnegie Hall, another in the New York Philharmonic Young People's Concert, under the musical direction of Leonard Bernstein, was produced and directed by Roger Englander.